Hello everybody, my name is Allie and I am here on behalf of Nora's Nursery and I'm so excited today we have Laura here. She's a sleep expert and consultant. Laura, you can go ahead and say hi. Woo, hello everyone. So excited to be here again. My name is Laura Wilson. I'm a senior sleep consultant and today we're here to talk about naps, right? Yep, naps. Yes. Awesome. So excited. I know this is going to be a big one for me because this is something that my my little one really, really struggle with, really struggle with naps. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, generally when I'm doing presentations or podcasts, like it's always a hot topic. Like, oh, really? you know, at least 50% of the audience will be like, I have questions about naps, right? Because they're very oh. challenging. There's a lot that goes into naps. So um so yeah, it's it, it's a lot for sure. So can you go ahead and walk us through some just general strategies when it comes to nap time? Yeah, so just like bedtime, the biggest thing is, you know, you want to have a little routine, um, you know, consistency, expectations, routines are super important for sleep. Okay. So um, yeah, like a condensed routine it doesn't need to be long, like a bedtime routine, but you know, sometimes you're baby or toddler is like just playing or, you know, stimulated in some way. And you're like, Oh, okay. You're tired. Or you look at the clock, it's nap time. And you like, you know, scoop them up yeah. and expect them to sleep right away. And our bodies don't just shut down automatically yeah. like that. So having a little mini routine is important for sure. You know, five minutes, maybe it's a diaper change. Maybe it's just a short story or song. Maybe you're just Gotta walking around the room, just wind down a little bit for sure. Um, so that's really important. Um, and then knowing a lot about, you know, educating yourself around, you know, how many naps my child should be having, which, you know, we're probably going to get into a lot in this, in this conversation, um, you know, how long they should be awake for, you know, finding the sweet spot for naps, you know, kind of timing it right where, you know, your child is really tired, but not overtired or undertired. Mm -hmm. Um, and so those are kind of the major, you know, points that I discuss when talking about naps. And then, you know, there's a million other factors that, yeah. that goes into it. Yeah, which we'll definitely get into. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, what is the 80-20 rule when it comes to naps? Yeah. So 80-20 is like 80% at home in their sleep space and okay. like 20% on the go. Okay. Um, you know, a lot of people ask me if I do sleep work, if I do, you know, sleep coaching, sleep training, does that mean I have to be home every single day? Am I going to be, you know, trapped in the house? Is it going to mm. be like nap jail, they call yeah. it? Um, and no, like I am all about balance, flexibility, Mental health is super important as well. So yeah. being able to like get out of the house, socialize, you know, go for a walk, whatever is super important as well. So you, you know, can practice the 80-20 rule, which is, you know, maybe you're having two or three naps at home and then one on the go getting out of the house. Or sometimes I... I say, you know, maybe if you've had a really busy day and you've had like all naps on the go, mm -hmm. maybe the next day you stay home and, okay. you know, you don't have a nap on, on the go, right? And let your child kind of catch up on some more restorative sleep. So, yeah, okay. that's 80-20. Like the balance there? Totally. It's just about balance, right? Um, and it's just about being mindful of that and, you know, what your child needs. Just like us, you know, if we're yeah. out and about and doing errands all day or socializing and, you know, it can drain us. We can get oh, really yeah. tired. And, and if we've had a couple days of doing that, then it's like, mm -hmm. Hey, you know what, tomorrow I'm just going to stay home and chill yep. and relax. Um, so, you know, babies, toddlers are not much different. Mm -hmm. So how do you um, suggest going about naps when you're out and about? Yeah. So there um, are some babies or toddlers that for them, naps on the go are easy. Like they just mm -hmm. fall asleep in the car really easily. Yep. They fall asleep in the stroller. Um, and it's not an issue and you don't really have to yeah. do anything. Like you just go for a walk or a car ride mm -hmm. and they fall asleep and yeah, not much, um, not much else that you really need to be concerned about, mm -hmm. um, with those, with those children. And then there are others that are a little bit more sensitive, like perhaps they're light sensitive. So, you know, trying to fall asleep in a really, really bright overstimulating environment is really hard for them. So you know, sometimes you need to, um, you know, walk a little longer, drive a little longer, keep them up a little bit longer so that okay. they're, you know, tired enough to maybe mm -hmm. fall asleep. Um, I always recommend like if they're at baby stage, you know, sometimes you can get 
you know, like a cover for the stroller, oh, you can yeah. portable sound machines, mm -hmm. like oh, yeah, in the I'm car. Really yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. to do that, just to kind of mimic uh, and recreate that kind of sleep environment at home and okay, just yeah. do that on the go. Um, so that's something that some parents can do. And then the other one is like, if they're not great, at, you know, car rides or stroller walks, the other thing is um, carriers, depending on the age, of okay. course. Um, but some would prefer to be, you know, carried and they're nuzzled in and it can be like darker and a little bit quieter. Um, and they fall asleep a little bit better than like being yep. in the stroller or the car. So mm -hmm. yeah, just knowing your child or if you have a child that, you know, um, oh, they're not going to sleep on the go, then just be mindful of like, when do I need to be home then? Like if they fall asleep bonus, but I yeah. know that my child won't fall asleep. So you know, they're a toddler, they're going to probably miss their nap. And then, you know, they're probably going to have a meltdown at some point because yeah. we're out at this like party or event. So like, yeah. what's our exit strategy? What's mm -hmm. that going to look like? When are we going to uh, leave? Like trying to just planning in advance. Oh, like pre -planning, once you, it. pre planning it a bit like, you know, okay, we're going to a party. It's right during my toddler's nap time. They won't yes. be napping. Yep. So, you know, I'm going to give my toddler lots of warning that we're going to be leaving, you know, even sometimes that can help with the transition and change, um, you know, 10 minutes we're leaving, five minutes we're leaving, two minutes we're leaving. Um, and then, you know, maybe having everything set up at home. So if you can make it back in time for nap, then, you know, you don't have to like do anything. It's just like a quick kind of read a short little story in, in their sleep space. Um, or yeah, just mentally preparing yourself that yeah. my child is probably going to have a meltdown yeah. and this is how I'm going to deal with it. And I'm going to like take deep breaths and mm -hmm. figure this out and like early to bed because, you know, yeah. they're going to skip their nap or it's too late for them to nap. So it's going to mm -hmm. be like an early bedtime instead. So, oh, okay. yeah, yeah. Just kind of pre-planning in advance when, you know, you know, the day is not all going to work out for naps. Mm -hmm. I remember um, with my little one back when she used to nap, whenever she, one of her, like as she was getting older and was like down to like one nap, it was always around like 1 p.m. And I remember like how, how you were just saying, like if you have like a birthday party or something like that, where it's kind of out of your control when you can schedule it, um, whenever we have something like that, where it'd be like around 1230 or around one, I'm like, I know she would fall asleep in the car right before. Yeah. So that yeah. can be kind of tricky to navigate. Yeah. And like, if they do fall asleep on the car ride, you know, they're going to fall asleep, then maybe you leave a little bit earlier so that they can get like, you know, a 30 minute nap in and they can make it through the party. Um, yeah. Or, you know, they're going to fall asleep after the party on the way home. And you're like, oh, shoot, that's going to really interrupt bedtime. It's like, yeah. you just give them a little kind of bridge nap or cat nap, you know, 10, 20, yeah. 30 minutes, and then wake them up. And then you're going to like, you know, judge based on their mood if you have to push bedtime or not. Um, okay. but yeah, just, just be mindful of like, you know, how long they're sleeping and when to wake them up. Cause you know, you want them to go to bed at a decent time, but yeah, it's being flexible, but then knowing kind of what to do in those situations can, mm -hmm. you know, help us parents out and help your child still, you know, maintain like a good nighttime sleep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So with, um, with my little one, I remember Whenever she, even when she was like a newborn, even when she was a toddler, if she would fall asleep in the car, for instance, yeah. she was a really tricky one to transition back into the crib or the bassinet, whatever. Even if she was like sleep falling, you know, like contact naps when she was really little. Um, I always love those, when, you know, back when they're so tiny. Yeah. But she'd fall asleep on me and I feel like, you know, I had tried everything to kind of transfer her. So like if it's, tr you know, she falls asleep on me or in the car, I felt like every time I would pick her up, you know, I tried to be as gentle and calm um, and kind of transition her back into the bassinet or to the crib. That was something that I always struggle with. Do you have any tips on parents or how they can make that kind of transition a little bit easier? Yeah, so again, every child is different, right? Yeah. So there are some that would have no issue with that transfer, right? They fall mm -hmm. asleep in the car, you scoop them up, put them in their sleep space, and they go right back to sleep, and it's not yeah. an issue. Um, and then there are others, like your daughter, that have an issue with that. So if you know your child is probably not going to transition well, then usually I say let them sleep for at least one sleep cycle, and we can get That's into what, what sleep do. cycles are. But yeah, just let them sleep for maybe like 30 minutes 45 minutes or an hour whenever they wake up 
or whenever you need them up by. So at least they got some sleep in. Like maybe yeah. it won't be their full nap time or the greatest nap, but at least they got some sleep in uh, better than like none or only, you know, five yeah. or 10 minutes. So, so that, you know, you can, you know, make it to the next nap or make it till an early bedtime. But kind of yeah, and then you have yeah. to kind of weigh the benefits and the, you know, the con the pros and the cons a little bit. Yeah, you do you just kind of have to know your child, right? And yeah. you know, you're you might be stuck then like holding them that entire nap <laughs> yeah. and can't do anything, yeah. um, which can be lovely as well. And some parents really love that. Um, but it's just one nap. And then you know, you'll move on. Um, when they're really little, sometimes, um, you know, there's like warming the bassinet or warming the crib with like, you know, a heated blanket or hot water bottle so that when you make that transition, they're not going from like a warm, cozy well, body like to like a cold. Of, yeah. yeah, the shock of that. So sometimes that helps with the transition. Um, but yeah, or just, you know, keep them where they're sleeping and don't move them unless you know your child is for sure like yeah. just going to go to sleep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it really sounds like it just depends from from kid to kid. It can kind of just be a little different. Yeah, and then it also depends on what kind of um, strategy or plan you're at, yeah. right? So if you are doing sleep work, hopefully you will have answered, you know, what to do. You know exactly oh, okay. what to do in those situations in terms of like, okay, they've just had like a five, ten minute nap in the car. You know, what am I going to do now? Um, you know, hopefully your plan has all those answers, which I always tell people is really important. Um, just make yeah. sure you have all the answers to those little questions like that. Um, so it depends on which, you know, approach you're going. Or maybe you're going the approach of, you know, we're not doing sleep work right now, so I'm just going to hold my baby for, you yeah. know, that entire nap. Yeah. <laughs> so can sleep training help that transition a little bit easier? Because I remember in, you know, the previous episode when we were talking about sleep training and things like that, um, you were kind of going over how babies can have or learn these skills to kind of put themselves back to sleep. So is that something that can make, you know, those physical trans transitions from like the car to the bassinet, can that help make it a little bit easier? Definitely, right? Because they know how to put themselves back to sleep. And if they're still mm -hmm. tired and it wasn't a long enough nap, then, you know, a child that has pretty healthy sleep skills mm -hmm. will usually go back to sleep. But it also depends on the length of the nap. So, yeah. you know, if they've slept longer than 10, 15 minutes, like they might not go back to sleep if they're a bit of a sensitive sleeper, even if you've yeah. done sleep training, right? But okay. Um, if they're not as sensitive of a sleeper, then usually if they um, have done sleep work, then usually they will go back to sleep. But yeah, sleep training can definitely help in those types of situations for sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, kind of switching gears a little bit back into sleep training a little bit. So can a parent or parents sleep train at night and then not do naps? Would there be kind of like a negative effect there if they were to kind of like how you were saying, like just do contact naps, you know, versus like making like yeah. a strict routine with them? Yeah, so it's kind of a mixed answer. If they were working with myself, I do everything all at the same time. I work on nighttime sleep and naps. Um, I feel that it's important for consistency, expectations, kind of minimizing those tears to do everything all at once. For some okay. babies, it can be really confusing you know, doing something at bedtime and then doing something completely different at nap time. So you can get a lot of mixed messages and more oh, tears. Like so are yeah, so. exactly. The expectations are different. So it's like you hold me for naps, but now at bedtime, I'm supposed to go down 100% wide awake on my own. You're not holding me so you can get more tears, right? So I try sense. to minimize the tears as much as possible. That being said, there's lots of parents that aren't quite ready to tackle naps yet. Um, and naps are more challenging for some babies and toddlers, whereas nighttime maybe not as challenging. So they want to tackle bedtime first and then just kind of survive and uh, and do that. Um, you know, everyone has different approaches and different children. So as long as it's not bringing more stress or more anxiety or more tears on everyone, then, you know, you have to do what kind of works for you. Okay. So with naps, um, I know how you're kind of talking about like the sleep cycles with naps. So can we kind of touch base on sleep cycles and then like short naps versus long naps and kind of finding that like perfect medium for our little ones? Yeah, yeah. So a sleep cycle is basically, um, you know, a certain amount of time we fall asleep and then we're like woken up in some way. Um, 
and th that's that's like the sleep cycle so during the day it's usually 30 to 45 minutes so a lot of people are getting kind of like really crappy short naps like three months plus is you know when i yeah. notice that most babies start to change as they um, are having sleep cycles now so they wake up at mm -hmm. you know that 30 45 minute mark uh and then they sometimes don't know how to go back to sleep. So if you were yeah. doing sleep work and they were independent sleepers, they might know how to go back to sleep, right? It might yeah. just be like a postural shift or adjustment. Like maybe they just kind of roll over in the crib and find a different sleeping position and go back to sleep. Yeah. Um, but for others that have maybe not done sleep work, they don't know how know how to go back to sleep. So, so then they will need help go, to go back to sleep, right? Okay. So, you know, that contact nap that you were talking about, you know, maybe after like 28, 29 minutes, you know, just your baby kind of shifts and adjusts a little bit, but then they still feel you, you kind of move a little bit with them, pat their bum, and then they get into another sleep cycle and go back okay. to sleep. Kind yeah. Like so it's just that, like longer nap. Yeah. If you're not ready to do sleep work, um, then yeah, some will try to get them back to sleep because usually the second half of the nap, which is more than an hour is usually the most like restorative part of, okay. of the nap. So not every nap will be more than an hour. I always want to you know, set those expectations for parents. Like it's very normal to have, especially when they're little, it's very normal to have maybe one or two decent naps and then the other ones are, could be shorter. Yeah. Um, so just, yeah, be mindful of like how much sleep is required and you know, how, how long they should be napping for. Um, and then at nighttime, the sleep cycles change. They go from every 60 to 90 minutes ish. So, you know, some parents are getting, they wake up and then sometimes they double up. So sometimes they wake up like every hour or every two hours or every three hours. So again, they're just going through a sleep cycle and a child that knows how to sleep would be able just to like push through that and get into another sleep cycle. Just like us adults, we wake up multiple times at night, but we just don't really know sometimes. And we're just okay. shifting and tossing and turning in bed because um, we know how to sleep. But babies who don't know how to sleep will then wake up, right? And look for yeah. whatever got them to sleep in the first place. Yeah. Oh, so that, that makes a lot of sense. So, um, so like the babies that wake up a lot at night, like not, not like the little, little ones where like, you know, they need milk or they yeah. need milk, yeah. but when they're, when they're waking up a lot at night, it's kind of, um, them just struggling to readjust back into like falling asleep. Yeah, exactly. That's definitely one of the major reasons. Like maybe they still require a feed, right? They're not physically or developmentally able to make it through the night. So maybe like, you know, they're still feeding or, um, you know, maybe they're, you know, developmentally going through like some sort of leap. So, you oh, know, milestone. Yeah, so, you know, their brain, their bodies in kind of overdrive and that kind of wakes them up a bit. Maybe they're teething, yeah. maybe they're sick. So there's other reasons why they could be waking yeah. up. But I would say if it's happening every single night, where your child is like waking up every hour, two hours or three hours, and you know, they're three months and older, it's probably because they're going through sleep cycles, and they just don't know how to go back to sleep. Mm -hmm. Okay, so can you walk us through the different ages, and then how many naps they should be having with, you know, around each age? Yeah, for sure. That's definitely important to educate yourself just around like, you know, my child is X age, they should be, you know, awake for this amount of time and doing this many naps that can also be really helpful just in terms of, you know, helping your child number one nap longer and number two, you know, nap and not become super overtired and um, so actually on my Instagram, I have like an awake time cheat sheet that I have up there that says like baby's age, how long we should be napping oh, okay. or how long we should be awake for and how many naps they should be doing. So, um, you know, finding that, you know, taking a picture of it, putting up on your fridge, like that mm -hmm. kind of thing is super important, but usually around, you know, newborns are kind of sleeping all the time, right? Like four yeah. to five naps. Um, when they reach three, four months of age, usually it's a consistent four naps. They can be awake for, you know, hour 15 to an hour and a half. And then usually around five months is when they go to three naps. And then six months is when they go to two naps. So between zero to six months, they're really going from like five naps to two lot. naps. That's a big transition. Yeah. So there's, it's a big transition. I always tell parents, it's like, there's a lot that goes on. And basically like every other week, your child is going to be changing and needing like longer wake windows. So, you know, sometimes people are like, 
Yeah, yeah, it is. It really is. It's it's hard on parents, but then once you yeah. get to that two yeah. now, yeah, right. Definitely. It's like once you feel like you're set in like a consistent schedule, and you're like, yes, we figured it out. Then like another yeah. week everything or two passes, yeah. and everything changes again. Yeah. Um, but once they get into that two nap schedule, then mm -hmm. then I find they hold that for a long time, right? Okay. They hold that until they drop. Um, they drop down to one nap, which is usually around 14, 15 months, but can be anywhere between 13 to 18 months. So it's a wide range. And even for all my months and, you know, that I'm throwing out here in terms of how many naps they should be doing every, I always want to say every child's different, right? Yeah. So, you know, some, for example, will go down to two naps at five and a half months, whereas others will wait all the way till like seven months. Um, so kind of knowing your child and we can talk about kind of dropping naps and what that looks like next um but yeah and then they will hold i think we talked a little bit about this last time in the podcast but uh, or the episode when they drop naps completely right and i think you had mentioned your your daughter oh. dropped it like very early like 14 15, 15 months, months. Yeah, super brutal. early. Yeah, brutal. that's really, really young. Um, mm -hmm. I probably only had like a handful of clients that dropped it that young. But yeah, it usually is anywhere between like two, two and a half to four, where they hold on to that one nap. So yeah, um, yeah it does get more consistent once they get to the two naps and beyond in terms of like having more of a set schedule for sure. Mm -hmm. So are there like cues with like watching your little one for knowing when to drop naps or do you kind of recommend going based off like those estimates where if you're sleep training, like would you just put your child down, you know, like stretch their wake windows and kind of do that on your own versus letting them kind of like fall asleep on their own. Do you know what I'm kind of trying yeah, to say? Yeah. 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 It's a bit of both, right? Like some yeah. babies will just naturally kind of fall into their own schedule on their own. And, you know, you'll be maybe really great at spotting when they're tired and when they need to sleep. And yeah. if sleep is going well and they're sleeping well for naps and sleeping well at nighttime, then you don't have to do anything. You don't have to change anything. Right. Yeah. Uh, and then there's sometimes when, you know, maybe for a long time they, they were sleeping really well, uh, but then all of a sudden they start waking up a little bit more at night or waking early in the morning uh, and you're like, what's going on? And sometimes they need a bit of a push to, you know, change their schedule during the day. So, you know, they might not be um, very obvious in the, the need for like a nap transition, um, but they might be showing some small signs and then you oh. have to like naturally, you know, push them. They might not be able to do it on their own. Okay. And then there's others that are very obvious that they need a nap transition right like they are just not sleeping for whatever that last nap of the day no matter what you do um, and you're like okay I need to drop this last nap or you're like running out of time in the day um, and you can't like fit in that nap anymore or you know for a toddler they're still napping but maybe they're an older toddler like three and a half or four and they're still napping but then going to bed at like nine or ten or later at night and you're like well i don't really want you to go to bed that way <laughs> yeah, you know exactly. i want to have an evening so then again you need to like push them to drop that nap so okay. yeah every child's different for sure um, but I usually tell people it's when something has changed with sleep. Like if you have an independent sleeper, they know how to go to sleep on their own and things were going really well and consistent, but then all of a sudden something has changed. Like I said, night waking, shorter naps, um, early morning wakings. It's like, so okay, do they know? Yeah. Do they need a schedule change? And that's where you mm -hmm. kind of just educate yourself around like kind of what the next schedule looks like or what, you know, they might be doing at this particular age, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that kind of brought up something. I remember, um, like, wh what is your opinion on, like, those, like, tracking apps where you can kind of track your baby's sleep? Yeah. I know that some of those can, like, suggest nap times and, you know, mm -hmm. kind of, like, tell you physically, like, oh, it looks like your baby's waking up a lot at night, you know, how they can kind of help. What is your opinion on using those to help? with? Yeah, that? yeah, I think they're great. Like when I had my first child, who's almost 13 now, there was none of those around. So it yeah. was like Excel, I'm A-type personality, you know, shocker, I'm a sleep consultant. And, mm -hmm. you know, that was like using Excel and I would like track their sleep and, you know, <laughs> yeah. look for the patterns and, yeah. um, which is fine. Like I even mm -hmm. tell people to still do that or just like write it down, right? Like write it yeah. on a pen and paper. Um, but yeah, now they have the apps like Huckleberry is super popular. 
that's the one I hear about the most. Um, and it tells you like, you know, how long they should be, be awake for when their next nap should be. So that's really helpful. I always just tell people be mindful that, you know, they're just pumping out like standard times, average times. It's the same thing as my awake time card, right? Like I'm just yeah. putting average times in, but every child's different. So mm -hmm. I do find that sometimes the like Huckleberry, for example, or what are other ones? The times aren't a hundred percent accurate, right? Yeah. Because they're just giving you general, day. yeah, general guidelines. So then sometimes it's like, well, Huckleberry or this app is telling my child that I need to, they need to be awake for two and a half hours, but I can't get my child awake for that long because they're going to be miserable yeah. or super overtired. So you kind of have to use your judgment a little bit and knowing your child. Um, yeah. And so it's important to kind of use those apps, but then also know sleepy cues, right? Like signs that your child is tired, signs that your child needs to sleep, um, right? So the obvious ones for babies are yawning, rubbing their eyes, they get like red eyebrows or red eyes, rosy cheeks, um, you know, getting staring off into space, um, getting cranky, you know, not wanting to like make eye contact anymore, not wanting to play with any toys. Um, so yeah, looking for that, but also watching the clock um, can be can be helpful just in terms of like knowing your child and yeah, when they need to sleep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it kind of sounds like a lot of um, just the information you've said today about naps, it kind of is like, you have we have all this information these days you can kind of take it with a grain of salt like these are just suggestions and averages like you were saying but it, you kind of have to like take that and also take in your baby's cues like you were saying like it's not every totally. baby not every you know six month old is going to be sleeping the exact same times and yeah I feel like especially today on social media that can be hard because you, you know you see this one person and their baby sleeping perfectly and sometimes you're like oh why is it mine but it kind of really shows like every you could be doing the same exact things but every baby really is just so different so different yeah and there's so many things that that can happen right and change yeah. and you know they're you know they're they're learning so many things within that first you know year yeah. to two years right they're going from like just lying down on their back to fully <laughs> walking right yeah, they're like developmentally crazy. going through and talking so much so uh, often that does affect sleep and affects nap yeah. times, right? So you get a lot of like nap protesting and you're like, you know, why isn't my, you know, people are posting about how her child just had like a two hour nap and mine screaming in the crib because <laughs> yeah, you know, yes, they're not exactly. sleeping. So it's so hard, right? Not to compare and, yes. um, and see all that social media stuff. But yeah, your child, they could be like rolling. They could be working on a new skill. Like some, they yeah. do love to practice all of their new skills in the crib unfortunately so you definitely see a lot of nap protesting and a lot of nap resistance when your child's like learning these developmental milestones which we talked about before um, but yeah it's hard not to compare right to to what and then some just aren't what others are doing and some just aren't great nappers too yeah. right like knowing if your child you know it has like a lot of sleep needs and you know needs a lot of has a lot of sleep hygiene and needs a lot of sleep or maybe your child doesn't and they're just really not yeah. that great of a napper but you know maybe they sleep really well at nighttime you know I always tell people that that's how try to get well. that yeah. yeah exactly but you know your child probably slept really well at night right mm -hmm. and caught up and got that restorative yeah. sleep mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. kind of yeah. made me feel like I was like not going crazy, but I'm like, what am I doing wrong? You know, because she'd sleep phenomenal at night. Like she slept through the night pretty early on, but then her naps, you know, everyone else's babies was, you know, were sleeping this, yeah. especially when you're like post freshly postpartum and you're kind of like over analyzing things and you're like wanting to give your kid the best and, you know, like have perfect sleep and, you know, you want to like, what am I doing wrong kind of thing. I feel like it's kind of easy to go down that path, but it's, it's a good reminder that like, every baby's different. Not every, not everything's going to yeah. work for every kid. And just really like focusing, like you were saying, like focusing on your individual baby and like on their cues and kind of yeah. taking bits, like the tools that we've learned, you know, like sleep training tools and stuff and kind of like piecing it all together almost. Yeah. Oh, totally. And like, and back to naps, just setting your expectations lower for naps too. Yes. Right. Yeah. Cause That's like, look at how much yeah, just look how much we just dove into, right? And this is only yeah. like really high level cold notes. So yeah. there's just a lot when it comes to naps. So just, you know, setting your expectations low and, mm -hmm. 
taking it one day at a time and, um, you know, educating yourself. There's lots of support. There's lots of help out there now, which is great. Um, you know, mm -hmm. find a professional like myself to help you, that kind of thing. Um, and then, yeah, and then just pri prioritizing, you know, their nighttime sleep then if it's been a really crappy nap day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Alrighty. Well, thank you so much for joining me here today. So can you go ahead and let everybody know, um, I know that you're mentioning um, on your Instagram uh, where they can find some little cheat sheets and stuff like that. Can you let everyone know where they can find you? Yeah, sure. So I am sleep goals underscore Laura Wilson. Um, like I said, you can find lots of tips on there. I do talk about nap transitions on there, like three to two, you know, two to one. There's my awake time card. So yeah, follow me on Instagram for those tips. And I also offer free um, discovery calls. The link is on my Instagram as well. So if you have any like nap questions or really struggling with sleep in some way, take advantage of that uh, discovery call. Awesome, awesome. So thank you so much for joining us here today. Awesome, thank you for having me.